Welcome back to The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. And today we are talking about the words and stories around architecture and the climate. We are so glad to have Dr. Praveen Biwaprakar from the University of Cincinnati with us to continue our conversation. So again, I want to go back to some really basic questions. Why is geography important in architecture? Uh, again, it's a great question because uh, <clears throat> geography will change the climatic conditions, right? Like extremely cold to extremely warm climates. It will affect architecture. Geography will offer different type of uh, climate, therefore different type of resources like the air to sun to water, uh, those will be different, but most importantly, the geography is also changing the culture. Geography is also changing uh, the variety of, uh, 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 they are also changing the culture and its meaning with the architecture. For example, um, building or home here in the United States means to us different than people who are living in maybe Asian countries. And so, so that sometimes it's the same place, it's a home, but home means different thing to different people located at different geographical locations. And their response to that building, therefore that architecture is very different. Like here we spend, in our countries, we spend a lot of time indoors, but you will find in certain geographical location, very less time is actually spent indoors so architecture is more outdoors, like around the building. And, and that is the difference. And that is what really fascinates me. It's the same topic, same definition, it's the same activity, but the way we perform those as a part of uh, with the architecture, it, it gives a very different meaning to it. It looks very different and it, its experience is very different. And that is the reason I absolutely love to travel because I love to see what those meanings are, as I also get to enjoy different types of food, as well as the languages, like architecture. I have to admit, I'm a lot more likely to travel for the food than for the architecture, and except when I look at architecture and think, well, that's pretty, or that's old, I don't have enough uh, you know, ability to understand and appreciate what's really happening. Although, Holland, I think if we had a tour guide like Praveen, who could take us along. And I think that may be to me, one of those next travel documentaries or something. It's just like architecture around the world, but looking at it through the eyes of an architect and, and having yeah. all these pieces. Now that you say that, I think about, uh, it must've been 2001. I remember traveling to Latvia and being wandering around Riga and looking at the buildings and thinking, these just look so different from anything I've seen before and really pulling out the architecture more than any other place I traveled before that. And I'm not sure why it particularly stood out to me. I think I wasn't expecting a European country to have every uh, house painted a different pastel color in a row, but that's what it was. And that kind of thing just, it jumped out at me more than in other places and I have paid more attention to it. I just don't know what to call it or what it signifies. Right. And, and um, I also realized that uh, at different geographical locations, the materials, those are available for making buildings are different. So therefore um, it looks different, but along with the material, as I said, uh, the culture is different. So therefore the craftsmanship is also different. The skill sets are different. And uh, that is why uh, we see architecture, which looks different which can be experienced differently um, and i think that is that is why i think uh, geography is so so important in uh, experiencing and understanding architecture yeah i couldn't agree with you all more there's a, a a park and i say that loosely because it's it's huge it's in switzerland and they have taken different um buildings and move them to this park. And, you know, Switzerland is bordered on multiple different countries and the materials you can get for those buildings are, are varied. And so it's fascinating to go to this specific park and see the architecture 
based on those regions and those areas. And it's all centrally located. So it's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's done. But um, all right. So Praveen, <clears throat> there was a story last night about a woman and her son with Habitat for Humanity. And they were one of the first recipients to get a 3D printed home in Williamsburg, Virginia. It was fascinating. And so this idea of resilient architecture and how it can be different from other types of architecture. And, you know, I'm thinking resilient products and, you know, we don't have enough trees to build all the two by fours anymore, or you're in a drought area. So talk to us a little bit more about resilient architecture. Sure. And I think the, uh, Interpretation, I, before we get into the interpretation, I would love to start with the definition of resiliency uh, because this word is used very often in both practice as well as academia. And the way uh, uh, I would use it is uh, resiliency is the ability of a building or that facility or the community uh, to both prevent the damage as well as recover from the damage. And uh, sometimes instead of damage, you know, we also use the word shocks, like those could be environmental shocks. And uh, <clears throat> on a side note, I would like to obviously compare it with our human experiences, like we had pandemic and many of us have gone through some of the, you know, uh, traumas, some of these shocks, both social, environmental, health, economic shocks. But then we have survived, or uh, we have been surviving it, you know? So that, that is the resilience. Uh, and then we are coming back. So the question is, can buildings do that as well uh, to when it comes to, <clears throat> say, natural hazards? Uh, hazards could be different, you know? It could be earthquake, it could be flooding, it could be uh, extreme precipitation and flooding or the heat. Uh, something like that. So, so in that context, buildings which can sustain these shocks and then still keep serving is what I would refer to as a uh, as a resilient uh, building or the architecture or the communities uh, or the group of buildings that you can do that. Those are those. That is the resiliency. That is how I would uh, use the term. And to your point, what is the difference? between resilient architecture and, and uh, from the other type of architecture. Again, to answer this question, I would say, you know, uh, just compare human beings. You know, there are human beings who, who are very resilient. Some may not be as resilient as others, but then they still look like human beings, you know? So it's same thing with the buildings as well. They look like a building, but what matters is how they perform. Uh, during those extreme shocks or during those disasters and their ability to come back is what makes them resilient. Um, personally, looks could be deceiving. Uh, so I would rely more on the performance. Excellent points. Very well done. Okay, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the last episode when we asked you, or Amy asked you what biomimicry is. Can you give us some examples of biomimicry? So um, you're right. As we talked about this in the beginning where uh, nature is a, such a wonderful design, right? And there are so many design living organisms, so natural organisms, and then <clears throat> living in a very unique extreme conditions and it has survived um, our audience knows you know there are some extreme conditions maybe there is some plant or some animal that lives there but nobody else can live uh, because that so-called uh, natural design has developed certain uh, either it has certain design elements or certain skill sets that help them survive so along the same principles like what is it that we can borrow from those principles and can we adapt it for the buildings? And I think that is where then suddenly it opens, you know, so many possibilities. So that's where there are some buildings which actually looks like animal, but may or may not behave like animals. So, so looking that morphing buildings like animals is one of it. And uh, the other option is like 
even if billing may or may not look like it, but it will behave like animals or behave or it will behave like uh, like those unique skill sets uh, that those organisms have. So, so these are these are like two examples. So, uh, two basic types. So, looking at the examples, like uh, recently uh, the Winter Olympics concluded that was held in China, Beijing Olympics. So they use the same stadium that they used for Summer Olympics few years ago. And if you look at that uh, stadium, which is called as Bird's Nest, it's a Beijing National Stadium, is one of the recent examples of biomimicry because it mimics that you know uh, bird's nest, like weaving kind of uh, approach. But it looks like that. Um, another example is again uh, Beijing Olympics uh, National Aquatic Center. You know, it's it's like a box building, but then it kind of it can change its color, it can change some of its behavior. So so it's a box building, but it can change the behavior. So it was very interesting to see. Uh, some other examples that uh, I can remember right now is like uh, the famous architect called Santiago Calatrava. Like his buildings look more like uh, insects uh, because it brings out the skeleton. Uh, example is Milwaukee Art Museum, which is uh, right uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan. And that building is actually, it looks like it's opening and it's closing. It's its a wonderful example. Uh, 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 Ground Zero uh, Terminal in New York, it's the same architect. So it's that one building amongst all high-rise buildings. You know, it looks like it's like it's like a, some kind of a creature there. So, so, so those are some of the examples which looks like it, these are inspired by nature. And then there are some buildings uh, in which there would be maybe some materials, the skins, building envelopes behave in a way that, you know, it will look like a normal building, but, but it will behave very differently. So one of my uh, uh, articles that I published in 2017 was mimicking uh, a, a reed frog it's a very small frog but it's outdoors and it can sustain 120 degrees fahrenheit heat without moving and uh, so what that frog does is it doesn't move much so that it limits its body activities and then also the skin layer kind of changes to um, to compensate that extra heat and but also to survive and uh, so i use that logic to design a building skin so that Building look like a normal building, but it will behave its uh, thermal regulation. Uh, it will change its thermal regulation so that it is tuned with the outside climate. So, so those are, I would say, two examples like morphing it, but then other is more like a behaving it, behaving like it. That is so cool. I I love that about the frog, but it makes me want to live in a house that's shaped like a bird's nest now or something, right? <laughs> I feel like I live in this boring house. <laughs> I know. I As you were talking, Praveen, I, I'm thinking, what other things in nature could architects try to mimic? And I, for the life of the first thing that came to me was a cactus. I'm like, it it survives in this very hostile environment. And yet there's beauty to it because sometimes it'll bloom and it's got, you know, life-giving nutrients in it so I'm just, i don't know it's somebody i don't know if anybody would want to live in a cactus house <laughs> uh, no it's it's i'm actually very fascinated by that and you you picked it up very well amy that you know for them it's survival and uh, but survival also comes with some kind of performance for them so i think they are uh, those natural designs are performing in, in the extremely hostile environments uh, because it's about survival. So uh, I think when it comes to buildings, probably we we are way beyond survival. We have reached to a point where, you know, we're looking for comfort. Like, is it too hot? One degree is hotter, one degree is cooler. And, you know, we are trying to fine tune that. You know, that is where we are like, uh, we, we are so dependent on like mechanical energy. And um, again, it then connects to the previous topics that we discussed. Right. Right. Well, let's go down the dark side just for a minute. Um, you mentioned this earlier when you were thinking about your college interest, and you 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 said it that uh, this idea of environment and architecture hadn't been politicized yet. 
Um, so let's think about some of the stories that media should be telling to help us understand the relationship between architecture and climate. And maybe where are some of the pieces of misinformation coming through and maybe what does the public need to pay attention to? Uh, I think this is also, this is a tricky question as well. Uh, but uh, at least today, uh, this whole topic of urban warming or global warming, uh, urban climate change, these are all uh, politicized as well, has gone a lot of traction and a lot of efforts have been made. But then I think my, my uh, I would say current challenge is, you know, we have so much of information now, we don't know what to do with it. Uh, sometimes when there is too much of it, uh, it's very easy to ignore that as well. And uh, I think in that context, uh, what I would say is uh, maybe, you know, telling people uh, about uh, what can be done when they are in that situation. For example, um, summers are getting hotter and drier uh, at some places. Then maybe media can tell uh, some, give them some examples of like, what is it that can be done? If it is too hot and too dry, in order to be first of all safe, then may and then be more comfortable, and then also use less energy. Um, I'll just take take a step further. When when the temperature increases too, I know it gets too hot. Everybody turns on their air conditioners. Eventually, that can you know affect the utilities, and probably we have heard that uh, the the power. Uh, blockage happens because of that. So a lot of efforts are being made to uh, see that can we cut down on the power usage that time and how can we do it? So these are some of the things that can be uh, shared with audience uh, so that they can take some steps. Similarly, when it is too cold, I know like last year, uh, even uh, Texas got some snow and uh, our outage was there. So like, so what is it that can be done during those conditions uh, is something that, you know, when we share it with them that time, probably there is more sensitivity to it. And then people can also pick and choose the information that relates to them. I think that is how we can connect with the audience, connect with people and then so that uh, they can they can make certain decisions, informed decisions, I would say. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there is so much out there, and you know, we, we kind of get lost in the noise, if you will, a little bit. So, being specific, and, and especially when you're thinking about someone in a disaster situation. When we started our first episode on this topic of, you know, when you're in disaster, you know, this is a reality. It's it, it's real to you because your home's leveled or your community's gone uh, because of a disaster. So that then becomes personal. Right. And and I, I understand that, you know, when, when somebody is trapped in that situation, obviously it will be very difficult for people to watch the TV that time. I mean, I would say media can also, uh, you know, kind of pre-plan it and then kind of give that information in advance before the summer comes, give that information be before some of the events happen. And that, I think that would be useful information. Mm -hmm. It will be more timely information, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Well, we have one final question we like to ask, and that's about metaphors. What's a metaphor to help us understand the relationship between architecture and the climate? I was <laughs> I was thinking about this question a lot, and uh, I use a lot of metaphors uh, when I'm teaching uh, on these topics. And I'm sure our audience have heard of a lot of these topics, uh, a lot of these metaphors. I, I think some of the metaphors that I used earlier, like uh, ecological design, there is a green design, sustainable design, and so on and so forth. Uh, really, the I think the main intent of the metaphors is to be able to capture the gravity uh, in a way that you know you, you can also grab the attention to that particular topic. And, uh, and since a lot of these topics are already out, uh, metaphors are already out there, 
Uh, the one that I I would share with share the one that I personally like, uh, and it's relatable uh, by or to the individuals, and that is I see architecture uh, or the building as the second skin, uh, because our skin really protects us from the outside climate. Building is the second layer of our skin uh, that really then protects us from the exterior climate. And, and you know, skin is something that we can touch, we can feel. You know, of course, we have clothes as well, you know, and we can add or modify those clothes according to the needs. Therefore, the question is, what is it that we can do with the buildings, those envelope, that skin, uh, so that it is in tune with the climate? And uh, take care of the building, take care of that skin in a way that we take care of our skins. Hopefully that will then minimize uh, not only environmental damage, but also it will help. We, I call it as a, you know, this bioclimatic flows facilitating that in, in energy that is inside us with the outside and be in tune with climate and nature. This is a great conversation, and people may want to continue it with you. Uh, where can people connect with you? So I uh, most of the works that I do are already uh, uh, posted on my website at the University of Cincinnati. Um, that's the easiest way to find what I'm working on, what I have worked on, and also the classes that I teach and uh, you will get my contact information there. Um, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, I can attest that your website has a lot of information on it because I went on there early on uh, when we were talking about this episode and I was amazed at how much information is available. It's a really, really well done and well organized website for um, finding some basic information about what it is you're studying and doing. Thank you very much, Dr. Praveen Biwa Perkar, uh, for joining us today. To uh, all the folks listening to us, we invite you to join us next week. We're going to be talking about a whole new topic. We're going to be talking about sports, and we'll start off with the stories of the World Cup. It's going to be exciting. So everybody get your pom-poms ready. Um, or no, I guess that's not for World Cup. Anyway, um, <laughs> but we are so thrilled to have you here, Praveen. This has been a great conversation. Um, thank you so much for your time and your expertise, just the stories as we're thinking about how climate and architecture intersect. So everyone who's listening, please leave us a review, rate us on Apple Podcast, become a subscriber to the Afterward Podcast. It does help us keep the conversations going. And as always, remember, you are welcome at our table. Thank you so much for having me as well. And uh, it was great to connect with the audience uh, via your podcast. <laughs>